Thunderball has it all from lawsuits, plagiarism, murder, misogyny, sharks, underwater battles, and nuclear weapons. Let's continue our deep dive into Thunderball and see what makes this movie tick. Hi, this is Tom Pizzato. And Dan Silvestri. From spymovienavigator.com. Today we're going to finish up cracking the code of Thunderball. We left off part one with Bond leaving Shrublands and Mr. Angelo, the Draval replacement, getting through security at the military base and then in the briefing room. And now he's ready to board the Vulcan NATO flight with the two nukes aboard. All right, so aboard the Vulcan. With the two atomic bombs, Major Duval is asked to sit at the co-pilot seat. This is where he sounds the alarm. He indicates all aboard should be affixing their masks. And then he inserts a poisonous gas canister into the system and kills them all. He's the only one safe. And now he can hijack the plane and bring it to the awaiting Largo. The scene is really well done. The authorities see the plane disappear off the radar screen. And Duval, Mr. Angelo is flying the plane low and to a rendezvous point with Largo. Largo's on his yacht, the Disco Volante, a flying saucer, waiting for the plane to land nearby, and he switches Wait, you just, you just slid that in there, Dan. The flying saucer yeah. is the English translation of the Italian phrase Disco Volante. Yes. The flying saucer is the name of the boat in yeah. Never Say Never Again. Of course, that's true. How odd. I like when he switches on the underwater landing lights and Derval knows where to land the plane in the ocean. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that, that really is. Yeah. Now, there's a, there's a few things about what happens in this scene, you know, behind the scenes. Ronald Udell and his team journeyed to Royal Air Force Base in Alton, where they made a plaster mold of the Vulcan bomber. Oh, yeah. The mold was taken to the Bahamas, where then the bomber was constructed out of fiberglass and lowered into the Caribbean. A separate bomb bay was constructed and photographed from underneath when Bond explores the wreck of the bomb, the bomber when he's going down looking what's going on. Mm-hmm. They ended up destroying this model. They blew it up so that other movies wouldn't use it. Yeah, I think there's <laughs> some parts underwater still, right? I think. Yeah, the frame was there, yeah. and it's turned into a reef. Yeah, It's okay. been covered over and turned into a reef. Yeah. The other thing about all of this underwater stuff and the, the, the yacht and everything, the Disco Volante, Largo's yacht, it was made from a real hydrofoil joined to a catamaran, and they held it together by two one-inch slip bolts. And then there's the part where it comes apart, and it worked really well on film. But when they were doing the practicing, they had a heck of a time getting them into disengaged. Yeah. They put together, they had like a two- or three-day shoot just to get that separation right. Mm-hmm. They got it on the first take. Wow, that's cool. It's nice when you get it on the first take. And yeah. I think they paid like a half a million bucks or something for that Uh for the yacht that they purchased or something that they had to refit. So anyway, it was pretty cool. Derval, so he lands the plane. It begins to sink in the ocean, and you could see the landing gear coming down. Some people say, that, well, how did the landing gear come out? You can actually see the landing gear coming down, so that it'll sit right on the bottom of the ocean. Apparently, it's relatively shallow water. So here's where Thunderball is definitely influenced by the silent enemy, as the team of Largo's divers leave the Disco Valente heading towards the sunken plane. Derval is still in the cockpit, of course, that's Mr. Angelo, on oxygen. Now, remember, Mr. Angelo, the Derval replacement, threatened Spectre and demanded more money, 250000 versus 100000 So the divers opened the cockpit and quickly cut his air supply. <laughs> but one thing I love about that is you say the divers, the guy who cuts his line is, it, is, is Largo. It, is it Largo? It is. Oh, and yeah, in you're so right. many of the Bond films, it's the henchmen who do the dirty deed. Yeah, yeah, he's acting. Where here, Largo's in there with his guys, and he actually is the one who cuts the air hose. Yeah, it's kind of like Blofeld in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. He was yeah. very active. Yeah. yeah. And for some reason, after he cuts his air hose, Angelo's seatbelt will not unbuckle. I, I don't know. Why or how? Well, I think it probably was sabotaged. Who sabotaged it? Because when Angelo, who was playing Derval, switched seats with the co-pilot in the flight, the co-pilot had no issue on buckling his belt. No, that's, that is true. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. I just figured it was sabotaged. Yeah, So, but now it's jammed. So I, I don't know. He's doomed to drown. I, I suppose maybe even if he got free, they'd kill him anyway and stuff him back in the Falcon. Who knows? Anyway, they avoid a, maybe one more fight scene <laughs> by doing this. Also influenced from the silent enemy... Underwater sleds are used to remove the bombs and take them aboard the Disco Volante. So far, Largo's plan is working flawlessly, and it is a reminder. Don't cross Spectre. We we remember in the beginning of the Spectre, (laughs) as the Spectre meeting number nine was eliminated for embezzling, 
And now they've eliminated Angelo, adding an extra $100,000 to their coffers. Unless they were going to kill him anyway and never pay him. But he had the envelope with hundred grand in it. Did the divers take that? I don't remember that. You don't see it again. So he gets into trouble. Mm, yeah. Neither Bond nor Largo actually take the money. Okay. Huh. Largo kills him by cutting the hose. Yeah. Then Largo grabs the box that had the detonators in it. Now maybe the money was in right, there. Right. Unless the envelope was in the box, Largo didn't get it. Huh. Then later in the movie, when Bond swims up to the plane, he takes Angelo's watch and yeah, dog yeah. tags, but he doesn't grab the envelope. Huh, okay. So huh. it either went down with him or somewhere okay. else. Well, the sleds were now, cool. You, also <laughs> ma- you mentioned these sleds, yeah. and they were designed by the production design team under Ken Adams. So the whole team was involved mm-hmm. with this. And the two-man sled to carry the A-bombs was actually built by cameraman Jordan Klein. When I had seen this, I had just guessed that the technology had evolved from the silent enemy, which had the real chariots, to what we saw in Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. I didn't know prior to researching this thing that the sleds were actually designed by Ken Adams' production team, and they weren't real things. They were designed for this movie. I just had assumed they had gotten these things from somewhere, and they were real devices. Yeah, we saw some of those at the Bond in Motion exhibit in London, actually. Some of the uh, other ones. That's very very neat. That's a great place, by the way. Bond in Motion, London. Go there when you can travel again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Yikes. Okay, so we know that nuclear weapons disappearing really happened in life, and so we can certainly believe this scenario. Note that the underwater photography here is fantastic. The domain of underwater cameraman Lamar Boren. He's a vet of Sea Hunt, if you remember that show from the 60s. Back at Shrublin's Bond is leaving, and Lippe is trailing him in the Black Thunderbird. Motorcycle is in hot pursuit also behind Lippe's car. So naturally, now we're fearing for Bond's life. Two vehicles in pursuit. The motorcycle fires a missile at the Thunderbird. That kind of reminds me of the spy who loved me in Sardinia. But the Thunderbird blows up. It explodes and crashes off a cliff. The motorcycle fired at the Thunderbird. Intentional? Oh, yeah. Number one, again, don't cross Spectre. Number one was not pleased with Count Lippe for hiring Angelo who portrayed them. Bam! You're dead. (laughs) Holy gripe. Yeah, now this is an amazing stunt with this motorcycle coming in. And really kudos to the stunt and production teams for this one. The Aston's riding at 30 miles per hour, and then the motorcycle has to speed up to catch this thing. There are a couple different things that are fairly well known about what happened in the shooting of this scene. But one one of the interesting things was what happened with Bob Simmons. He gets out of this car and nobody saw him get out. And the thing explodes. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we just killed our prize stunt man. Yeah, he actually shocked them. <laughs> yeah, he like, oh, I, don't, I don't know if it was a tapping on the yeah. shoulder or whatever. but And they were like, oh, good. <laughs> Where'd you come you, from? You could see this actually on the extra DVDs that come with the ultimate editions for the James Bond movies. And for Thunderball, there is one for sure. They show the filming of this very scene. And it's great to see. And by the way, a, a lot of the extras on the ultimate 007 editions were produced and directed by the talented John Cork and his company, Cloverland. John was nice enough to leave us a voice message for our first anniversary show, if you recall. So, a lot of fun stuff. Check that out if you have the ultimate edition. So, the cycle's being driven by, we find out, Fiona Volpe. Yeah, she takes that helmet off and waves her hair. (laughs) There's her hair. A dedicated Spectre agent, played by Luciana Paluzzi. Oh, yeah. They actually changed Fiona's last name because of Paluzzi's Italian heritage. She was going to be Fiona Kelly, and Luciana did a great job. Tough and dedicated. No wavering. No wavering. Yeah, she played that role great. Yeah. As another aside, when they cast Claudine Auger, they changed her last name in the film to Derval to reflect her French heritage. So that's great writing and edits. The Spectre Threat. Now that Largo has the bombs, Spectre can deliver its threat to the world. And they send a tape as we listen to it at MI6 headquarters with the double O agents lined up in chairs for the briefing. Of course, Bond is a little late. (laughs) That's always cool. (laughs) Now that we're all here. (laughs) Yeah. The tape details that they hijack the NATO flight 759 and demand 100 pounds sterling or they'll blow up either an English city or a U.S. city. Thunderball is the operation code name. And as the agents open their sealed packets, you see that. Now, there are theories that the Thunderball name came maybe from the military and their experience with nuclear tests and the mushroom cloud that ensues after the bombs blow up, and certainly from World War II experiences of real nukes exploding to end the war, that it looked and sounded like a Thunderball. 
So that may be where the name comes from. The international powers of NATO are going to be forced to pay this ransom unless their agents can thwart the plan. Bond in M's office details that he saw Durval dead at Shrublands. So he wants the Bahamas assignment to track down Durval's sister Domino, of course played by the French actress Claudine Auger. Three sides here that I think are kind of cool. I like that the signal that the deal was accepted by NATO forces that would delay the destroying of a city if the ransom was paid was that the Big Ben was to strike seven times at 6 p.m. the next day. That was, that was kind of interesting. I like that. Okay, so you know me, Dan. I'm going to look into this. So wait, did, did Big Ben ever strike seven times down? <laughs> uh, no. It has had some issues with heavy snow stopping the, the chimes. It chimed multiple times for the each year of the monarch's life for the funerals of King Edward VII, King George V, and King George VI, and to celebrate the opening of the 30th Olympics. However, I've not been able to find a, re- a record of it having a okay. problem due to an electrical storm in 1898, as they actually say in, you hear a news thing saying that Big Ben struck seven times. The last time it did this was when there was an electrical storm in 1898. Right. I never found anything that ever told me that existed. All right. Thanks, Tom, for that research. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. That was a fun two right. hours. The second little tidbit I think is, is interesting here is, is, of course, Bond had a hat when he came into the meeting. And he hung the hat on the rack in Money Penny's office. But when he leaves, the hat is gone. Now, there's a whole story with James Bond hat. In Diamonds Are Forever is the last Bond film where in the gun barrel sequence, Bond wears a hat. And was the last time in the sequence that was black and white until, of course, Casino Royale in 2006, which was a brilliant use of black and white. Lock and Company made the Trilby hats, and they're still around today. So Bond does wear hats. Trilbies and Straw Hats early in the film, Dr. No from Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, other than skiing and then in gun barrel sequences and so on. But when he sets the Trilby hat on the rack in Thunderball and comes out and it's gone, why is that? Does it come back again? I can't remember. I know George Lazenby as Bond in Our Majesty's Secret Service he, in the pre-title sequence, he's driving and he's got a hat on. Roger Moore was really never seen wearing a formal hat. He enters M's office once with one as a prop, and, and I think a nod to the history of Bond, and he hangs it on the rack. Timothy Dalton wears the top hat at Felix Leiter's wedding in License to Kill. So what was the point of the hat disappearing in Thunderbolt? I think it's a mystery. We researched a little bit here and couldn't find a definitive answer. It's intentional for sure, because Bond noticed himself in the movie that the hat is missing. Yeah, it was, it was like... Was it just a continuity error and Sean Connery went to go look for the hat and it wasn't there and they decided to keep that yeah. in? It was you really weird. You don't really see Bond wearing hat, a hat like a Trilby again, do you? I, I don't think in any of the other movies. The last tidbit is, was 003 at the briefing a woman? There were some still shots seen and there was a woman in that chair. Maybe she was a stand-in or maybe 003 was a woman. We have not seen a woman as a double O agent before. Of course, we find out in Skyfall that Moneypenny was in the field for a while. But yeah, that was always an interesting thing. And I think maybe in the movie, you can't really see who's in number three. Yeah, but there are agent type characters played by women in Bond movies. But this is one of those where you're kind of. Oh, yeah, but they're not double O agents. Oh, that's true. That's true. Usually they're for the opposition. Plenty of those. All right. Yeah. All right, now we're in the Bahamas. Well, we have loved the exotic locations of Bond films from Dr. No in Jamaica, from Russia with Love in Istanbul, Goldfinger at Fontainebleau Resort, Miami Beach, Stoke Poges Golf Course in England, Lucerne, Switzerland, and we're loving the Bahamas here in Thunderball. It just makes you want to be Bond and be there. Very clever way to draw fans and viewers in and to participate. Well, especially back when they made this, there was not as much air travel. Right. Right. So the, the world was bigger and these places seemed so far away and exotic. It. And this was a way to be exposed to it. And it's like, oh, this is this lap of luxury and all of this stuff. Yeah. And now some of these places are a little more touristy. But when they made these movies, there were a lot of only really rich people. Went yeah, to you the may Bahamas. not have seen any of this stuff ever, unless in a magazine or something. So you're seeing this in the movies, live and video. Oh, it was pretty cool. Pretty neat. So in the Bahamas, Bond finds Domino swimming. And then the gorgeous night scene. Bond at the casino with 500 pounds to wager. The shots of Largo at the gambling table with Domino. 
and Bond joining is brilliant. Bond plays against Largo's wits. He quips, I thought I saw the specter of defeat on your shoulder. I just love that. It's just kind of like in your face, specter. Emilio Largo, an Italian, says that Bond was trying to put the evil eye on him. And we have a way to deal with that from where I come from. And he holds out one hand with his index finger and his little finger, but the other is folded back. Yeah, and it's like the yeah, BS sign, exactly. Really. And in, in real life, there is a thing in Italy called the malocchia, oh, that's which is true. the evil eye. Yeah. And they sell charms for this, usually gold, 14, 18 karat gold, with the hand symbol that Largo just gave <laughs> us in this film. And you wear that on a chain around your neck to ward off the evil spirit and the evil eye. Uh, I have one. I'm not surprised, <laughs> oh, <know>. Dan. <laughs> All right. So uh, later at an outdoor restaurant, Bond is having lunch with Domino. And he orders, of course, Beluga Caviar and Dom Perignon 55. We learn that yeah. Domino met Largo in Capri, Italy. She talks about her brother, Francois Derval. They must leave, and Largo invites Bond to his Oceanside Villa, Palmyra, for lunch. This was actually the real summer home of a family, the Nicholas Sullivan family from Philadelphia. According to the Battle for Bond book, the Sullivans rented the place to Eon, and then they stayed. So Ian expected them to leave, but they actually stayed for the filming and invited people over to watch the filming of the movie. So they'd just sit, sit out <laughs> on the side having a cocktail or three while they're watching the filming going on. Yeah, it's a beautiful so Meanwhile, place. back at Bond's hotel, he discovers someone is in his room. He traced through a hidden tape recorder in a hollowed out book that this happened. Yeah. Right, so, so discovering one of Largo's guys is in the shower. He overcomes him and sends him back to Largo. Tell him the little fish I throw back. So Largo, obviously, number two inspector, was not happy. And we know that's not a good thing when he's not happy. <laughs> not, when Spectre's not happy. Well, when Largo's not, not happy, especially. So he discovered that Bond got the better of his guy. And at Palmyra, where Largo has one swimming pool filled with sharks, he has his other goons throw this guy into the pool to be devoured by the sharks. The part of the scene I love here most is how calm and cool Largo is, as they throw the guy in. He He's walking away, not looking at it. And he kisses a specter ring. You've got to <laughs> love it. It's dedication. Uh, it's kind of like dedication. in the movie My Spy when we talked about people setting something up to blow up and they're walking away as the explosion happens and they don't even look yeah. back. Yeah, there's something cool about that. That's very popular. Yep, now, absolutely. And, but this is 1965. Very cool. All right, in NASA in the Bahamas. Bond's in town with Paula Kaplan, played by Martine Beswick, of course, from Russia with Love fame as the Gypsy Zora. She's Bond's CIA contact in NASA. And Felix Leiter is there, here played by Rick Van Nutter. And Pinder, Bond and Felix's Bahama-based operative in NASA. They enter a building and there's Q. <laughs> I like when Q is in the field. Every time Q comes on the screen, yeah. I smile. Because I love I love. That's even the in Never Say Never like, Again, when the new Q from that movie comes in, you still kind of get a smile because it's played totally different. Yeah. So they had a building and there's, there's Q. And he's got a few gadgets, of course, for Bond. The underwater breathing device. When a rebreather is not available, good for about four minutes. A Geiger counter camera that takes underwater infrared pictures. A safety flare that he could be found with. Q is amazing, usually, anticipating what Now, if you Bond want to know more about be. this rebreather, we talked about that in the podcast episode of The Real World Part 1. So in the meantime, Spectre's doing the demand for three to five carat flawless diamonds worth at least 100 million pounds to be delivered to certain global coordinates. Some people, of course, did research on this and found out the coordinates really make no sense. <laughs> I'm surprised Tom didn't well, do Dan, that. Well, Dan, actually, I, I, I did look this up. <laughs> oh, come so on. So the Mary Archipelago, they mention, is around uh, 11.29 <laughs> north and uh, 98 yeah. degrees east. Roughly, <laughs> and it's off the coast of Burma. And I'm rounding the latitude and longitude here a little bit. The coordinates they mentioned, 20 degrees north and 60 degrees east, is a spot in the Arabian Sea, a little bit east of the island of Masara near Oman. Okay, so in other words, it's not anywhere it near where they sit in the <laughs> Okay, all right. But if you're just watching okay. this movie, right. you, would, so you probably would not have any idea go. that it didn't make any sense. All right. All right. Again, influenced by the silent enemy, Bond is diving to inspect the Disco Volante from underwater to look for hatches, etc. 
listen to the Silent Enemy podcast for a lot of connections between Silent Enemy and Thunderball. As Largo's goons notice Bond underwater, they drop grenades to get him. Yeah, I'm thinking, <laughs> there's a good idea. You've got a couple of nukes on board, and you're, that won't draw any attention to you. But anyway, they're dropping grenades. I, th- I thought the nukes were hidden. Them. They weren't on the Disco Volante then. Weren't they over in that cave area? I don't know if they brought them on the cave okay. yet. Yeah, maybe they did. I'm not sure. That's right, a good so point. you mentioned maybe. the Silent Enemy podcast. And they use these depth yeah. charges to get the chariots there. Here in Thunderball, they use hand grenades. It's the same objective. In Silent Enemy, they're using depth charges. Here, they're using hand grenades. I think the roots mm. for these hand grenades probably was those depth charges in the Silent Enemy. We talk a lot yeah. about connections between the two movies in that podcast, but I just don't think we hit that one, so I figured I'd throw it in here. All right. Well, of course, Bond escapes, and he gets to a road where he's coincidentally picked up by Fiona Volpe. They end up back at the hotel after a harrowing <laughs> ride in her Mustang. That's a funny scene. <laughs> yeah, it's a good scene. They get the pictures developed that Bond took of the Disco Volante from underwater, and it shows an underwater hatch. That leads Bond and everybody to believe that this whole operation might be an underwater one, including the plane. They check, and sure enough, the Disco Volante was out for six hours that night of the Vulcan's disappearance. Hmm. Felix estimates that the Disco Volante could do a total of about 90 miles in six hours. So when Bond is having lunch at Helmyra, I like the little gun routine is amusing. (laughs) Bond is looking at one of Largo's rifles, and he says, the gun looks more fitting for a woman. And Largo says, you know much about guns, Mr. Bond? And Bond says, no, but I know a little about women. (laughs) (laughs) That's great stuff. (laughs) Now, that scene was actually supposed to be a lot longer. They filmed it longer, and they cut the heck out of it. So I'd love to see what they cut. Yeah. But the important thing in this scene is Largo tells Bond that the disco volante can do almost 20 knots. So assume that, hey, it's 19 and a half knots. That's roughly 22.4 Why did you pick 19 and a half knots instead of 20? Well, because he said it's almost 20. (laughs) <laughs> okay. so I, I, I took a half off so in six hours the disco volante can do a total of 134.64 miles not 90 as lighter said <laughs> okay you know maybe lighter knows maybe a little bit more about the disco volante maybe lighter knows how much fuel the disco volante can hold and knows based on that hey it can only go 90 miles so maybe lighter thought it could only go about 13 knots because that would actually be pretty close to 90 miles who knows yeah, but Bond does guess a lower number when he's with Largo at Palmyra, and Largo corrects him. And Bond knows this, that it could do 20 knots or almost 20 knots by the time he and Leiter are searching for the plane. He's good at asking questions. That? Oh, it can do whatever. I can't remember the number. He says 15 or whatever. Yeah. Oh, no, we can do almost 20 knots. So he gets the information yeah. so they know what's the search area they need. Yeah, yeah, although they're searching in a much smaller area because of the 90-mile thing from Leiter. Anyway. So Bond wants to see what's going on at Palmyra, so of course he arranges for a blackout and sneaks into Palmyra at night. It's a nice scene. It's a lot of good stuff going on there. We won't go into all the details. But Largo has, of course, emergency generators, and the lights go back on. I don't know if you've ever seen blackouts in other movies, have you? Uh, let's see. Die Hard oh, is one, the first one that <laughs> oh, comes to mind. there you go. <laughs> uh, anyway, Bond ends up fighting one of Largo's guys, and they end up in the pool. And Largo has the metal cover drawn over so they can't escape. And then opens the hatches for the sharks to go in there. Oh, yeah. Thank God for Q. The emergency breather saves the day. And Bond escapes through the hatch. Yeah, now he actually went past the plexiglass that was in the pool between him and the shark. Yeah, but I think they said that the plexiglass didn't go all the way up. And and he was actually Yeah, one of the scenes, there was a four-foot section. And they didn't tell Sean Connery that there was this gap. And, of course, the shark finds the gap. And Connery goes flying out of this thing. So what you see when he escapes that pool, that was real fear because Sean Connery was was panicked that about these sharks. He did not like these sharks at all. And was like, I'm not swimming. I mean, if you you remember Dr. No, even the tarantula, he wouldn't let the tarantula go up his arm. Yeah, that's true. Well, who wants a tarantula running up your arm? They're harmless. (laughs) Well, I know, but it was supposed to. That's another story. All right. (laughs) Anyway, he gets, he gets back to his hotel, and Fiona is in his room. And she and the Largo goons had already captured Paula, and Bond had found her dead at Palmyra. She took a cyanide capsule so that she wouldn't talk. Kind of sad. 
She could have been a more robust character, I think, in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that they let her play. And wow. So anyway, Fiona and Bon, of course, they have sex. And then they were to go to the Junkanoo annual parade in the Bahamas. It's kind of like yeah, I don't Carnival. know if you've ever been to one. They are so loud. Yeah, but she has, she's got different plans for Bond. So as he opens the door, of course, Largo's goons are there. And then Bond says to Fiona, don't think I enjoyed that. I did it for King Okay, now hang on. The book Thunderball came out in 1961. This movie yeah. came out in 65. Queen Elizabeth yeah. became queen in 1952. Shouldn't we really be saying for queen and country? It seems like an odd line for me just based on the timing. Even 55 years later, he would still say for queen and country. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know why he, he says that. You didn't do enough research on this? I time? sure <laughs> checked into it. And I couldn't find why they would have said king. Okay, so. all, right. all right, so you did. Of course okay. I looked into it. <laughs> all right, so she delivers one of the best lines, I think, in any Bond movie. And it was something like, you make love to a woman. This is Fiona talking to Bond. You make love to a woman and she turns to the side of right and virtue. But not this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is great because we've all seen this in all the Bond films up to this point where the bad woman turns good and whatever. It happens all the time, but not this time. And she never does waver. She is right on the button with this one. She doesn't waver. She doesn't fall for it. She doesn't turn to virtue and goodness. So I love it. Now, as a little sidebar again, the Junkanoo is a real parade. And we know from the film that the action is taking place in May. Because I think they I think, say it's May a, I think it, it was filmed actually in April. The oh, timing in the movie. Of, okay, I got you. In the movie, it's, I think, May 27th or something, the, where the threat is going on with the nuclear weapons. The Junker New Parade occurs twice a year on December 26th, Boxing Day, and January 1st. So anyway, they wanted to get that in this movie, and they did. Yeah, and they now there's, there's actually a good it. discussion again in the Battle for Bond, the mm -hmm. book about how this was done. You know, when they were on the island, they needed extras for the Junkanoo, the scenes at the Cafe Martinique and the Kiss Kiss Club, they yeah. needed extras for that. Then if you're Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, you're not going to pay for those extras. So they actually worked with the Nassau Tourist Board, and they said, okay, we're going to donate money to the Red Cross. And a group of Nassau social elite came in. These were real just Nassau people yeah. came in to portray themselves for two all-night parties. How and productions that? threw in a bucket of caviar as well as several cases of champagne. Now, for the, they used some of these people in the Junkanoo scene. Remember, EM Productions put this Junkanoo on. They said, Let, we want to do this Junkanoo on an off date. We're not doing it when you guys normally do it. And the community really mm -hmm. pulled through on this. I, I love the way they did this. Eon paid prizes for the best costume for this Junkanoo, and the locals really had fun with this thing. Mm. During the chase, yeah, there's a yellow okay. sign at one point and it says Sydney Shoe Repairs. And just beyond this is a group of people, and they're wearing 007 hats. Right? The hats oh, say yeah. 007. <laughs> you really have to look for it because there's so much going on, you'll miss that. Well, but one it, pointer for you is look for the dog peeing. There's actually right yeah. in this scene, there's this dog that decides to urinate. It was originally cut by Peter Hunt, and Cubby and Harry said, no, keep it in the film. <laughs> so it was a, it was a, that was a fun scene. All right, so they're in the car, and Bond escapes, and they shoot at him, and he's injured in the lower left leg. He patches it up in a bathroom and then goes to the Kiss Kiss Club, which was a beautiful outdoor bar and restaurant with music and all that. He grabs a woman to dance with, but Fiona finds him and cuts in. Of course, they've been after him, of course, at the Junkanoo because he kind of lost them there. Other Largo guys are hiding behind the curtain behind the band, targeting Bond with a pistol. Eventually, they shoot, but Bond whips her around, Fiona. and she His timing is back. impeccable. Dead. Yeah, uh, it is. His finger over yep. the bullet hole and everything else with the blood. I, <laughs> I don't know how he does it. And the bullet it's doesn't great. pass through her and hit him. <laughs> no. Thank God it was a, maybe yeah, a lower caliber know. pistol or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But, of course, he escapes. And, and now he's in the helicopter with Felix trying to find the plane. And he finds it. He dives finds the fake Derval with the real Derval's military tag and watch, and he removes them, and he finds no bombs on the plane. Now, he can get Domino on his side, convincing her that Largo had killed her brother. Now, you know, Domino is... Uh, 
she plays his niece, but really is his mistress, Largo's mistress. She's with him all the time. So if Bond can get her. She'd be a good one to turn. He couldn't get Fiona. Yeah. No, never. Largo's preparing his frogmen to retrieve the bombs, either to turn them in for the ransom if it's paid, or to navigate somewhere to blow up a city. And the target seems to be Miami. Then Bond, in disguise, is one of Largo's divers. But again, they discover him and retrieve the bombs from a special doored cave, and they leave Bond in there. Bond's good at escaping. (laughs) So he he gets out of this cave and uses the flare there that Q made for him, and Felix finds him with the helicopter. Always with the right gadget at exactly the right time. Always carry this in your pocket. So now Felix and Bond rally the troops, their troops, and a drop is made of their divers, and the great underwater fight ensues. Again, look now, there have the been a lot of enemy. movies since the 1958, The Silent Enemy, and 1965's Thunderball that had underwater fights. Yeah. However, I can think of one that preceded Silent Enemy with a tie back to Thunderball, namely Creature from the Black Lagoon. That movie had Rico oh, Browning that was a good movie. acting or swimming as the gill man for the scenes that were underwater. In Thunderball, he was the second unit director for the underwater sequences, and he directed the underwater <laughs> okay. scenes in Never Say Never Again. So these guys who do it all this underwater work seem to do it pretty much everywhere. It's a specialty. So Bond and crew, of course, save the day in the final scene. The final fight is aboard the Disco Volante because Largo escaped and got back to his yacht. Bond gets aboard, too, and Domino is there, and the battle begins. Largo is about to shoot Bond. Bond, about to die. (laughs) Holy jeez. When you see Largo grimace, eh, and he falls over the controls with a spear in his back, shot by Domino. Oh, yeah. They dive overboard. The yacht crashes, and boom. That's the end of the threat. End of the movie. Number two Yeah, that boom was not just the boom. Well, it wasn't the nuclear bomb. No, but it was actually, and we'll talk about Colonel Russian in a minute, but... He got this fuel, and John Steers, who won an Academy Award for the work he did on this movie, he, he, mm-hmm. they didn't know how explosive this stuff went. It was some kind of experimental rocket fuel or something like that. And so Steers <laughs> puts it all over the boat. They decide to really blow up this boat. So the thing they put together with the two halves by these two bolts, they douse it with all this mm-hmm. fuel. They set it off. The explosion is so big, they look, and the boat's just gone. And they're like, what happened to this boat? (laughs) And again, Robert Sellers describes this really well in The Battle for Bond. He says, they look up and they see this black dot. And all of a sudden, the parts from the boat come (laughs) falling down out of the sky. This thing had just like shot up into the air. (laughs) And so they had to deal with debris coming down. But fascinating. And then he gets into downtown where they did the, the junk anew. And the windows were all blown out, and that was 30 miles away. It was one Holy of the most, geez. the biggest explosions ever for a movie. It's just amazing. Yeah. So there's a lot of cool little facts and stuff like that that are in the movie that you think, okay, that's, that's kind of neat. Like the sky. The sky hook, because you just real... said that the movie ends with Bond and Domino together, and they get lifted up with that hook. Yeah. And that's actually a real thing. Yes. Uh, Colonel Russian helped them get yeah, that. The real thing. Yeah, I think it was like uh, 90000 bucks he got waived or something to try to do that or yeah, something. Exactly. It was a lot of money. He got it for nothing. Yeah. And also, you remember in Goldfinger, in, in, when we talk about that in our podcasts on Goldfinger, that Goldfinger always wore something gold in the movie. Well, in Thunderball, if you notice Domino, and if you know the game Domino, which are little black cubes, or rectangles with the white dots on them, you'll notice that Domino is almost always wearing something black. And You told me that, and I was like, really? Go. And I'm like, I didn't catch it in Goldfinger initially, and I didn't catch it here, but you've caught him in both of them. Yeah, and I kind of look for that now. I was thinking, are they going to do that? And a name like Domino, of course, you immediately think of the game. So that's, good that, catch. That's, that's why you kind of keep, keep an eye out for that. All these other things, Claudine Auger and Adolfo Celli were dubbed because they both spoke English, but they didn't think that would be good enough for that and so on. I kind of 
I guess you could understand that, but <laughs> literally, <laughs> no pun intended. If you do that, but they were they were terrific, and I whoever dubbed them, I I think they're yeah they're they're actually in the in that they, book. The they did a great him. job. Yeah, and again, I, I love that uh, Fiona Luciana Paluzzi never turned from Spectre and never went to the good and and, and just. And Bond couldn't flip her. So I, I like that in this movie. All right. So I said we were going to mention Colonel Rush, and I'm going to mention him briefly here because we talked about him a little bit in From Russia with Love and with Goldfinger. He's actually, he was a military guy who helped out on numerous Bond movies, including getting things like the Skyhook in this movie and the, and the fuel that we talked about before. In Goldfinger, there's actually a specific reference mm. that the crew does during the movie that you actually see his name, which is kind of fun. So this is a film with a lot of underwater war. And the scene when Largo kills Angelo, the diver, Courtney Brown, he was a member of Ivan Tor's crew. He was doubling as the actor. According to diving specialist and underwater cameraman, engineer Jordan Klein, who's also the guy who did some of the work on the sleds, his air hose was supposed to be actually cut. And the diver was supposed to have a canister of air to live off of when, when this thing gets cut. However... He dropped this bottle, and he nearly drowned before they could come save him. And he ended up in the hospital from him. So he ends up in the hospital from this. He goes back to work, and later in the film, he has another big problem. There's the scene, and Bond flicks a switch on that backpack thing he had underwater, and he fires that explosive yeah. spear at that diver. Well, that was Courtney Brown again. He was given a piece of explosive to place on the outside of his wetsuit. When the spear was fired and it was mm -hmm. done on a line, it was designed to strike this thing and create an underwater explosion. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. they put this thing under his suit instead of outside of his suit. Did he do it? Or they, I'm not sure who did. The, people... the thing ended up under his suit instead yeah. of outside his suit. Yeah, so it, <laughs> it blew a smart. hole in his suit. And again, he <laughs> back in the hospital. I mean, this poor guy, what a tough movie for Courtney Brown. Yeah, holy Jesus. All right. Well, that's a wrap. That concludes our treatment of Thunderball. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. And our discussion on the movie Thunderball is done. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you listening. Let us know what you think, and please subscribe to our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. And tell your friends about it, too. We appreciate that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>